Can you hear me decently? Okay, so for the fans to run uh, roughly 75% of the tank has to be hot and the tank that the fans located in has to be above 82 if I remember right. Uh, it cuts out if the humidity gets too low and it won't turn on if the humidity is already too close to the limit. Uh, the tank that it's in, it's immediately adjacent to a very hot set of lights. There's uh, two 22-inch UV fluorescent tubes right next to it, and they have an operating temperature of probably about 95 to 100 degrees. So the hot lights are located directly above the set of pools in that tank. So they kind of cook humidity out of that tank continuously. And there's also the two bubbler inputs in that tank. So it triggers on and then usually pretty quickly turns back off. It's not really necessary. Uh, after I integrated it into it and wrote the software for it, I pretty much continually kept making it harder and harder for it to turn on because it was it just seemed like it was kind of pointlessly running. Uh, if you instead of letting the tank get to a point where it needs where it might, you know, it doesn't ever need it, but if it needed heat evacuation or humidity evacuation you know you can kind of take care of that on the low end right now none of the tanks produce enough humidity to ever cause it to trigger on in order to desaturate the humidity level in the tank that doesn't ever really happen anymore but that's because each of the different tanks has a different kind of base humidity uh one of them is pretty much always over 90. One of them is always exactly what it should be. And then the uh, hot tank with the UV lights is right around the lower end of what it should be. Uh, and then the toppers are all kind of averaged out since they're, you know, the transitional path between for the air between the different tanks. Uh, each one of the different tanks is kept at kind of a different temperature. Yeah, basically, yeah. They go wherever they want. They don't seem to care. Uh, I don't really, there's a, they have a preference for which tank they molt in to some extent, but they uh, don't avoid any one of them. And even within the same tanks, there's some different temperature areas. Uh, Let's see, the well, the hot tank has a cave that is colder than the rest of it, because uh, I disabled the heater, the heating elements in that area, uh, and the toppers I mostly just ignore. I take data from them and print it out. There's a uh, really old computer running some light distribution of Linux that it's plugged into just so I can get the data out from it. Uh, I have a serial monitor set up that boots with that Linux distribution so that it's constantly being supplied serial information from the USB plug that powers the Arduino. And so it prints that to screen it pulls that and prints it to screen via the I don't know the serial monitor software that I run on there but actually I don't even think I have the screen plugged into that computer right now because it runs so stably that it's not generally a concern there's some other little temperature humidity indicators located on the tank that uh, you know will tell you what it is at a glance
and that that fan i have it screened off but it's you know i don't have any kind of like butterfly valves on it or anything it uh it's always open to the room atmosphere uh because it's located next to the the hot the hottest set of lights it probably exhausts passively most of the time uh but there's three sets of bad seals in the tank that are intentionally left bad so that there's passive air exchange and uh the pools because there's three of them and two of them are pretty big they generate enough humidity via the two air pumps that power them that uh it's usually the opposite of a deficit uh, <laughs> uh it produces enough to keep it high enough uh and the airflow is kind of biased by the temperature to distribute it into the middle tank the middle tank has the least amount of controls on it uh but it it's the average tank because the cold one is on the left end the hot ones on the right end the humid ones on the left end the not so humid ones on the right end so the middle one's pretty much just an average of them i don't know i'd say try to do it all at once uh, we have a terrible thread somewhere in this group uh when i added the third one it needed new substrate and i go into detail and thread about it but uh when we added the third one we got some kind of complicated condensation patterns i think what happened is we created a fairly extreme heat gradient uh and so it appeared to have basically cooked all of the moisture out of one tank selectively can cooled it down in the topper connecting the new one which was still fairly cold and condensed like three or four gallons of water into it overnight uh it completely flooded and destroyed that tank and killed a couple crabs and that was because when we added the additional tank the other two were stable and fine but the new tank wasn't see i thought the the sand was warm and stuff from being outside but by the time it got all set up it was considerably cooler and uh i guess less moist than the other tanks which i think is why it migrated to that tank we never had had that problem afterwards i changed the heating a little bit after that happened but uh like the two of the tanks are treated as one heat zone it'd be trivial to make it a third heat zone but because they kind of they're tied together they're heated by the same uh segment of heat film they behave kind of in step with each other so it kind of hopefully prevents that from ever happening again if you don't so we've i've had to change the substrate since then due to a mold problem and basically what i did because that you know they were going to be different uh i just taped cardboard or plastic sheet I think it was plastic wrapped cardboard actually in the gaps in between the different tank joint uh joints so that they could stabilize and come up to temperature and the humidity could stabilize and all that before they were allowed unrestricted air exchange to each other uh because it's kind of you know especially in that case the to three 365 gallons or so of space you probably end up having a hard time bringing them all up equally or at the same time uh so you can just kind of put it together but subdivide it at the same time just to limit the air exchange between them so you don't get some crazy water migration thing happening uh we, we've speculated before that unheated toppers might 
cause problems, might cause condensation problems. So if you have, you know, moist substrate and water sources in your bottom substrate tanks, and you just have this dead cold topper at the top, you could get some kind of heat engine thing going on where it perpetually pushes moisture out of the substrate in the bottom tank, condenses it in the top, and it rains back down the walls. I don't think we've really seen that with everyone. I'm not sure how legitimate of a concern it is. I've never actually let it wait. Uh, partially because there's always been at least one of them set up. But uh, the quantity of crabs involved there versus what they could be afforded conditions-wise in a temporary or isolation tank isn't didn't seem worth it in my mind to not just put them in there. I know between that, the post I mentioned that uh, was about that flood, there's a link to that in another post that Anna made about toppers. If you look up in the group search function on Facebook, uh, just toppers and Anna Keel, you get this fairly long thread that addresses quite a bit. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's the more succinct comments that we have about that experience. There's one and a half. Uh, if I had more space, I'd do two. Uh, in the hot, in the our right tank, our hot hotter tank with less substrate than the other ones, it's generally kind of more of an activity tank than a molting tank. It has the full size. Well, okay, so I changed this recently. It used to have a large salt tank and a very small freshwater one, just as a water source in case for whatever reason, someone couldn't get across to the other side or didn't want to, but uh, I changed them out to both be the same size. They're slightly smaller than the big one used to be. Uh, I really don't remember how big they are. I think each one's one gallon. Uh, they're still a much larger, like two gallon fresh tank in the far in the left tank, our cold tank that uh, a lot of people seem to favor molting in uh i'd put another one in there but there's just not really space in there with how much like rock facade stuff i have going on in there i don't really remember beth i think we got them in like 2011 2011 or 12 and we only we had three of them in a kind of two layer tote thing for a long time. Yeah, that I'd recommend that or spreading them out in between or something so that I, the distance is trivial when you consider how far they travel in the wild in any given day. But there could be other concerns with them not being able to get around, you know, like if a big crab decides it's going to post up and be a bouncer in between tanks or something. I don't know. Thank <laughs> you.
Seems a bit more reasonable. They seem to, th I don't, I can't say I'm a really big fan of them in our, uh, in the two tanks we have that were from the lady in Illinois, it has small like uh, Tupperware pools and they really seem to throw a lot of splashes and stuff up. I don't know if it's because of that or other reasons. Both of those tanks are substantially more damp than our actual main tank. Uh, the substrate in our large tank is probably fairly dry uh, versus what? I don't, I don't remember if it's the current suggestion. The old suggestion was sandcastle consistency. It's definitely not that wet. Uh, it's not entirely free flowing, but it's definitely not as wet as we used to keep it as we used to recommend it. I don't have any problems with bubbling in the deeper pools though. If they're like at least six inches deep, five or six inches of water, I don't have I don't I've never noticed any kind of splashing issues at all. But with those right now, I'm just using air driven, you know, small beta fish type filters. And there's less, the, the bubbling's less violent from those bubble driven filters than it is from just air stones. But there's no way that we could maintain humidity without air being pushed through each one of those pools. And I think it's also perhaps fairly important that we have that kind of hot light above two of the pools. Um, I agree with Courtney in the, uh, I think she said that she's, she believes that they prefer colder water. I think I probably agree with that. I heated the pools for a while and other than them, appearing to enjoy sitting on top of the heater itself. I, I believe water activity decreased at that point in time when I was keeping them around 80, 82, I think. But that was mostly for an experiment with plants and snails and stuff, and they just ate all of it. So there's not really reason to do it. I think I still have a heater in one of the pools, but it doesn't really do too much. It's in the cold tank, though. They get to a temperature, but as that temperature increases, so does the rate of evaporative loss. So the warmer they are, the more humidity they'll push out, But uh, which keeps them kind of cool. But the ones in the hot tank probably sit around 78 to 81 degrees, I think. But the one in the cool tank's definitely closer to 70, 74. Those UV lights are also a fair distance away from the water surface. Slightly. It, it, that probably depends mostly on the air temperature of the room. Uh, that particular tank, the leftmost one, it probably, 78 is probably the maximum temperature it sits at. It's slightly cooler than the rest of them. It's intentional. I have a heater on the back of it, but I just actually don't use it right now because it doesn't, it keeps that temperature just fine.
one of the upside down tanks is a 29 that's probably 30 percent full of foam uh to make it look kind of cavey and the other one is a 55 that's open and full of arboreal kind of stuff and sticks and stuff the biggest consideration with like toppers that size is really planning ahead for what you will and won't ever be able to touch again uh the so two of the bottom tanks have two of the 55s on the bottom have a 55 shared equally between the two of them and it means that you can't get to the majority of either tank uh, we take it apart like once a year i think that's about what it's been <laughs> at most once a year uh, but it's such a huge risk trying to lift that 55 off the top that there has to be something you know really worth getting in there for but you can kind of wiggle your arms around or you get really good poking with sticks doing complicated stuff at the end of a stick uh in order to access stuff in there are you talking about the ones with the like the fronts that open yeah that would have been a way better idea What? I don't really think, I don't know, it's what we've had for so long. I, <laughs> those are really the only two issues I think we've dealt with with it, aside from making sure that they can get between the tanks easily. Uh, sometimes it turns out that what seems like would be an easily traversed path between the two or between two tanks doesn't really work out too well. We've changed that a lot over time. Yeah, I definitely notice the uh, our fan runs more in the winter when the heat's on. Uh, they have a slightly harder time keeping cool, I mean, clearly, because the heat's warmer than the rest of the year. I'm also using really low output heaters. It, the, the heating might be more impactful if you're using higher wattage heaters uh, and you're trying to match the different tanks together i also have small thin film heaters in between like on the ends uh between two of the tanks because there was a lot of airspace on the side of one for a while uh but they fit in there fine also but uh the the kind of heaters I like to use are very low power. Uh, they run almost all the time, but they don't actually make a large contribution the whole time. Uh, 
I think half the stuff maxes at like 86 or 96 degrees and the other stuff maxes out at 93 or something. So they can be on all the time and they don't really require a whole lot of switching because they're not actually outputting all that much energy. Uh, it might be a little different with the high output stuff. I also don't know how much of our heat really comes from the lights. I know the large topper. So one of the important things with that, one of the reasons why it might not become a cloud chamber and uh, cause a really bad temperature gradient might be because I have a four foot long, four bulb like shop light fixture sitting on top of it. And like it's fluorescent tubes, so it doesn't make a lot of heat, but it definitely produces an amount of heat uh, sitting up there on top of the topper. So there might be some unidentified action where that prevents the large topper from turning into a heat sink because, you know, there's at least some energy being driven down into it. <sighs> When we had a mold problem, it did not transfer between tanks because I, I think because the tanks were different moisture levels. Uh, like the spores are going to be everywhere no matter what anyway all the time. So I don't think necessarily as long as, you know, there's not like a substrate bridge between the two, two, two tanks. I don't really think they pose most much of a risk in infecting each other unless like you had actual mushrooms growing in there. But, uh, you know, the, the funguses that we all seem to run into periodically, I think for the, aside from the tropical yellow mushroom one that comes up so often, I think they're mostly just household things. So I think it's probably pointless trying to, prevent contamination between each other i think it's more about just making sure the moisture doesn't get too high while it's too hot to kick off a fruiting or expansion or whatever i don't know if it if the size has any impact on that uh There was, at some point in time, there was a handful of people doing kind of unadvertised, drier than usual tanks. And uh, while mine isn't an example of the almost completely dry tanks, it's definitely on the drier side of not, of what, uh, after that one flood, or no, there was the flood and then there was the mold thing. Those are two separate problems. After the mold problem, I've let the substrate remain fairly dry. The cold tank is pretty wet, though. It probably does count as sandcastle for the most of it. Uh, but it's also cold. So not cold, but colder than usual. So there might not be as much of a trigger for fungus to grow in it. There's also a lot of isopods in that tank. They might just kind of keep it not growing, or if it is growing, not visible to me. I don't know. Uh, we've had varying amounts of them in there over time, but we definitely didn't always have a sizable amount in there enough to hold a population. They definitely 
are multi-generational now though and seem to maintain a pretty stable small population which doesn't isn't the case for everyone uh my pools grow algae too but i let them do it uh i spent a while taking very regular ammonia readings and ph readings and stuff from them and they never really became a problem i have had like the diatoms grow a couple times in the smaller fresh pool, the hot fresh pool. Uh, that's gross. I try to kill that when it happens. But uh, just the kind of perpetual slight green haze, I don't try to treat that because I, the nitrogen's going somewhere. Yeah, they are. Uh, they use air-driven bubble filters with various sizes of foam and uh, ceramic biomedia stuff in them. Uh, I've put activated charcoal in them a few times. Uh, I tried using, I can't remember the brand, those little beta fish filters that come with the uh, filter packs that slide in and out but i didn't really like them they filled up and got scummy really fast uh or i just had improper expectations of how often you'd have to buy new little filter inserts for them uh, i had one of those when those filters get full there's a path for water to leak out the back of the pump so a month or two ago we had one of those filters plug up and it shot all the water in the pool out off the edge of the pool into the tank that was kind of miserable so i don't plan on using that style again but that was just probably a one-time problem Yeah, all the, all the filters I use, I think you could describe as using sponge type stuff. There's different cell sizes of foam in them with like the ceramic stuff at the bottom. And then we just got two small ones for the smaller pools. And I don't really think they work too great. They're not getting dirty enough. Uh, so I don't think they really have... Or the the, the pink socks, uh, cart, uh, cartridge ones, I don't really think they're working that great, but there might just be a lower biological load in that tank right now, so they might just not be getting, the water might not be getting that dirty. But the large fresh tank has, well, it has java moss in it also that's been in there for years now stayed alive for a long time that sucks up some of the you know ammonia or whatever from the tank but it always has algae on it i just don't care I've tried plants in it a few times, but they just yank them out. They don't mess with the java moss for some reason. Um, I had like other aquatic moss in there that was actual moss because the java moss is algae. But uh, the actual moss I had in there, they kind of ripped it up a little bit. And uh, it probably made it like six to eight months. Uh, I don't know why they don't mess with the Java moss thing. It's been in there for a very long time. I'm always surprised it's still alive when I pull it out. Uh, duckweed or something like that might work if you're trying to put plants in the water. They would come in and out of the water all the time and take it out with it, stuck to it. So it might cause some kind of trash problems with it falling off or getting stuck places. But or depleting the population of it quicker than it can replenish itself. 
but uh, something like that where there's not one large contiguous plant for them to kill or pull out, probably a better option. But yeah, for like the controller stuff, if you get, if you decide to do that or start poking around with it, uh, I, we can like in the forum, in the Facebook thing, we can, I can probably share code and troubleshoot all that stuff to some extent uh, and share what I have laying around. I'd have to go through it though and make, find which ones are weird versions and not. You're welcome. I don't think we have this thing. 